Real estate investing can bring big reward and big risks. So know your risks. Welcome to the Real Estate Risk Report, the show for real world insight on real estate investment risk. Now, here's your host, Lance Peterson. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Lance. This is the Real Estate Risk Report. So today I have with me John Fortes with the Fortes Company. Um, so John is, you know, he's done a lot of multifamily investing over the years, and he'll share a little bit about sort of his background here. Um, and but you know, he also is sort of in a unique position, and guys like we like to have on the show, in that you know, he, he started to invest, you know, in, into other sponsors deals and is starting to build sort of systems and, and investment vehicles and things sort of around that. So, you know, he's sort of learned how to, you know, dig in and, and vet and, and kind of conduct that, you know, deal level due diligence and sponsor level due diligence, the things that are sort of near and dear to our hearts here. So I think he's got a lot of interesting insight, especially for those who are maybe more in a passive investing capacity, um, you know, trying to become better, you know, investors themselves. I think that, um, you know, John can sort of give us some really interesting insights. So we'll, we'll get into that in, in today's episode, but John, why don't you give us a little bit of background, sort of how you, you know, got into real estate investing and, and what's led to, you know, what, what really seems to become a, a real passion of yours. Um, and, uh, uh, so yeah, just kind of give us that backstory. Now, first of all, thank you for having me. And anybody that's listening, please do me a favor. Pause, go rate and review the show. It's awesome. It, it allows more exposure for more people to hear our messages. So I appreciate you, man. Thank you for yeah, having me. My pleasure. So I started uh, because I'm a, I became a basketball referee. And my aspirations was obviously there's different levels to it. You got to start at the you know rec leagues, high schools, and then start trying out and auditioning for colleges. And it's even like that for the NBA. They come and put you in grassroots and stuff. Mm -hmm. So my aspirations is to be a division one basketball referee. So being a referee, you need availability. You need time. You're an independent contractor. When you're an independent contractor, they assign you a game for a weekend. That's fine. Everybody can make a weekend game. But what if they assign you a game at Duke, North Carolina, for you know mm -hmm. seven o'clock on a tuesday you have to be at the game hours before the game like hours before the game starts preparation and all of that so having availability for me was 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 huge I, i'm an it professional so i needed cash flow read all these books on the stock market realized basically i ended up with real estate real estate creating cash flow so from there, we put me and my wife, we purchased a single family investment property in Florida. I'm out of Massachusetts. And so we have family local to the asset. And the minute we got on the contract is when I was flooded with a bunch of multifamily conversations, podcasts, books, just made me look at scaling differently. Because if everything you're hearing is yeah, after, you know, 10 assets, you eventually start scaling into multifamily. And then when you start scaling to multifamily, you start scaling to commercial multifamily. So I said, you know what, I'm going to get some education on it. Went and purchased some education, started really educating myself on commercial multifamily assets, going to conferences, just meeting di different type of operators. So I told you a story when we got on, before we got on air was, I didn't really know about passive investing. And that's really true, even though I'm meeting these operators, because I'm thinking that, oh, you know, I'll just be an operator like them. Very naive, but my naive allows me to dig into things. Yeah. So I started digging in and all of a sudden I'm consumed with syndication. And I'm like, all right, so find the asset, raise the capital and okay, let's see if we could do this, right? Started just partnering with people. My first asset right after my single family was a 62 unit in Johnson City. We JV'd. I love the JV model. And then the same partner ends up finding uh, a, a 41 unit and we have to syndicate it. And he comes to me and says, you know, <clears throat> if we syndicate this, you know, do you have the knowledge on it? I don't really know exactly mm. what to do. And I'm like, man, I asked so many questions. I got cheat sheets all over the place. So 
have you already consulted with attorney? Have you already done this? And, you know, so we, we do all that. We syndicated, we had the capital raised. Uh, 15 months later, we ended up exiting out of the asset uh, during COVID. So it was a very good experience. In between that, I, I syndicated a few other deals as well. So to, to get to where I am now is I found that it was more efficient for me as a real estate investment firm to start offering something more to my investors than just one-to-one opportunities. Mm -hmm. Because if you're putting 50,000 in one opportunity, you know, if that deal goes sour, even though it's conservative on the written, all of that, you're weighted against that one deal. Now, if you have a fund that's truly diversified and and let's just even use three assets. If one deal goes bad, you still weighted off two deals. Two deals have to go bad for it to, to, to be completely a, a dud. Right. Yeah. So I, I started thinking, I started reaching out and just picking, picking people's brains about it, asking questions. I found a mentor who just happened to just raise a $10 million fund on his first one. And now during the time that I met him, he's raising on 400 million. So it was a great discussion. He just allowed me to just pick his brain answer and he was very honest and and said, just, it's a lot of phone calls, a lot of phone calls. If you want people to do it, because when you're raising them for a fund, you don't have assets to show them yet. You don't have any investments to show them yet. It's just, you have to be, you know, liked, uh, known and trusted between these people. And they got to believe in what you are telling them. And if you already have the proof of concept, that, that's kind of like good for your background. So I have a little bit of that behind me, but I wanted to take it to another level with the fund because I felt like it was more fe- efficient and beneficial for my business to be able to just have my investors and invest basically on primarily on their behalf through the fund. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like, you know, we had talked before the show and, and obviously we've, you know, with, with our firm uh, investment firm have kind of been following a similar model since, you know, 2012, um, and, you know, so I, I think what we're seeing in the industry, right, is, as you and I discussed, is, is just there's a trend toward, um, you know, more of what would be sort of these, these allocators, those who are sort of the professional investors who are looking for opportunities and able to sort of dig in at the deal level and really scrub, you know, these pro formas on these, these syndicated deals. Yep. Right. Because what you see on the operator side, and this is this, you know, I, I use this analogy a lot, but it's just, it's the whole, to be an operator, to find deals that are worth doing, you know, and then to execute what more than likely is some sort of value add strategy or redevelopment strategy. You know, there's a lot of moving parts and the business model is a bit, you know, once again, there's a whole nother discussion about, you know, how well aligned these things are, or they aren't, but fundamentally as it stands at this moment, you know, you might get some kind of acquisition fee, you know, that might pay some bills. But once again, you've been working for free for months trying to find the deal and, and wrestle it to the ground. So it doesn't go very far. It's probably paying whatever you've already, you've already spent the money. And, and then whatever asset management fees that you're earning, it's just really not enough to go around to pay all the people you need to ex- even execute the strategy. I mean, like it, it, it works, you know, so not to say like these guys are charity cases or something, but the piece that becomes very difficult, and this is where I think where where you you see the synergies between firms like John's and 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 the one that I you know my day job, which is Verivest, is just it's all that middle and back office administration stuff because having to build that out, even the software that promised to do whatever, it's like you still need an operator. Someone's got to do all this stuff. They got to know what they're doing. And then the reporting and all stuff is really what's fallen down. And I think that's where a big frustration for many investors has been over the years is just the reporting is never up to snuff. And it's just, it's just the communication isn't where it should be. Well, the issue is that it's difficult for them to marshal those resources to cover all their bases, right? And at the end of the day, you know, I think for operators, it's more important than where they can really differentiate is their ability to locate assets, buy them right, execute their strategy, that's really where the differentiator needs to be. And I think that what you're going to see and what I hope to, you know, and guys like John and I, I mean, I want to proliferate more and more of is that is, is what I guess you could call the private equity real estate, but at more of the, the, you know, the micro level, not just, you know, these private equity real estate up until this point has been sort of, it connotes this, 
you know, these 50 person firms, you know, it's kind of like, it's like this, it, it's private equity in general, private equity firms, whether they're venture capital firms or, you know, leveraged buyouts. I mean, these, these feel like these monolith, you know, giants of the space. And what I think you're going to see is more of what John's doing. And I see it in, you know, in our admin practice of just, it, they add value, you know, guys like John, which we'll get into here in a minute, right? But just seeing that if an operator can find and, and form relationships with guys like John and, you know, and collaborate with them and have them sort of bring capital into their investment vehicle, create diversification for uh, the passive investors, right? And and then allow the operator to have fewer relationships to manage, not to mention it, it's with people that kind of speak the same language as them. I think it just ends up being a more efficient way, even though it at, on the surface, it feels like a middleman was inserted. And I think you look no further than, you know, venture capital is a great example is that, you know, fundamentally, you know, Andreessen Horowitz is getting access to probably the best high tech startups. I mean, if, if, you know, with the best potential, your ability is just some angel investor in, you know, in South Carolina or something to ever have exposure to it. It's just, it doesn't happen. And I think that that, that industry was built very, you know, that's how it was built. And, but I think in real estate for the same reasons, it's going to happen here where, where, you know, your ability, and you've seen the crowdfunding movement tried to solve for that, but what we've seen over the last five or six years right? Is that the number of deals that make it, you know, onto the shelf, so to speak at any crowdfunding site, it's, it's very constrained. I mean, it's always been, you know, at any given moment, the number of deals that are being crowdfunded is just few and far between. So from a consumer's perspective, you really don't have much selection anyway. And so there's always been this problem of access of how do you get access and operators aren't really super interested knowing that they already short staffed anyhow to lower the minimums minimum investment amounts to a point where they, they they can't have 200 people in a syndicated deal. And then to have four of those a year, like they can't manage it. It just doesn't pencil out. And so what happens is that most of the deals that get done, your average person is never even aware that the deal existed. And that's not going to change. That's going to persist. And, and so anyway, that just sets some context for like what, what, what John's talking about here. So you know, when, when we, when we, with that in mind, you know, from your perspective, when you are now in that seat where you're looking at an operator, why don't you give us some insight into how you go about one, vetting the sponsor and then two, you know, digging into deal. I mean, like, that's a, that's a big question, but I think that like kind of starting there as to what is your, more is that professional passive investor or in this role, like what is your process or, you know, sort of, determining whether or not a sponsor's worth even spending the time to look into as a starting point. Absolutely. Um, the, my betting process is I, I onboard one to two new sponsors, maybe even three a year to my practice. And the reason why is I built, it takes me a year to cultivate a relationship with a sponsor. Um, uh, and I use that same model when I'm JVing and partnering with other mm-hmm. people. The reason why is uh, partnerships are like marriages. And you want to understand the person, you want to understand their communication. I've met them, I've walked around with them, I've had a drink with them, I've you know, yeah, eaten yeah. with them, I've socialized with them. It's just going from there, I never enjoy the experience of when someone connects with me at a conference. And, and, you know, when you had a conference, Lance, it's, you know, Lance, we got a partner one day and then I disappear for six months and I come back with a deal saying, here's the deal. <laughs> yeah. Come on, man. It doesn't make sense. I would never partner with anybody like that. But if we kept in contact every couple, you know, a couple times a month and, you know, and, and it builds into something and then you just, hey, John, check this out. I just want you to take, you know, put eyes on this. I'm like, yeah, how are you building a team for that? You know, and, and yeah. we've already kind of like built that formality towards that step to naturally happen. So that's why it takes me a little bit to ba- uh, basically either invest with a sponsor or even uh, partner with people. Mm-hmm. So sponsor sponsors in particular, I have, you know, I, 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 actually, I actually just kind of get a feel for them. Are they good people? Is this someone I want to get? Uh, be around? Is this someone I want to do business with? Could we go do something, golf, basketball, whatever you want to do? Could, could we do the, the, like, could we do activities together? And then from there, 
obviously I'm a number cruncher too. So I review probably more deals in a quarter. Um, I mean, in a month, maybe then uh, someone, the average investor probably analyze, you know, analyzes in a quarter. So we sift through so many opportunities that we're already seeing from these sponsors. And that's the advantage of investing with a small boutique firm that'll, you know, that has a fund that can go fund to fund and, and, or even take down their own opportunities the, you can blend them or whatever you want to do with the fund, but vetting sponsors and vetting partners in general is a process for me that I tell people don't take it lightly. Don't, don't just dive in. Don't just jump into something because you never know who's who. And especially if it's multiple partners, make sure you have an idea of everybody. Yep. You know, everybody can be front facing on the computer with the website and this and that, but how are they when they are, you know, dealing with other people's money? Are they stewart for yep. other people's capital? Or are they just, uh, you know, more about themselves? I like to get that vibe. And if you use your own intuition, sometimes it saves you from a lot of things. So that's kind of how I go about it. I know it's a little quirky and a little bit long. I, I say about a year, but you know, if nine months happens and we're still constantly communicating, I think we built a good relationship. Yeah. No. And I think with another one of my guests, I just the other day said, you know, basically was like, dude, six months. Right. So time. Okay. Like I, like I say, my whole axiom is it's, it's trust is the transaction. Okay. Like, like, that's the gating thing. Like if, if, if you can't create it, which is what you're, what you're articulating is sort of the time to trust. And I think that I, and I love how you kind of phrase that is that see us at Verivest, you know, we run the background checks on the principles of, of a sponsor, right? So we do that, you know, for the benefit of all, all the John Fortes is any, you know, Joe dentist or, you know, uh, Tommy attorney, whatever, you know, whoever's interested in, in looking at these people, you know, that's one thing like that tells us, Hey, you know, do they got a clean background? I mean, that's important to know and having it done once and, and annually is, is huge. And then two, then it's the claims they're making, you know, their track record and verifying those things. So those are all really important and monitoring what happens post investment to make sure all the money's going where it should go. I mean, those are all very like empirical things that we know it's binary. Is it, that it, is it good or bad? Right. Um, but as John is alluding to is that even when all that's good, Right there still comes down to that other level of of sponsor level due diligence, which is time consuming, and that's what he's referring to. Right, like getting on the phone and f figuring out how they're wired and how they approach things and how do they react. I mean, now, obviously there might be some some flags or some things in their track record that will point to maybe how they would have, but let's all face it, we've been on a raging bull run where everyone looks like a freaking genius and everyone's looked like a genius, and that's great. But we're about to come down the other side of this thing where, you know, it, it's it, it's not always the case. And so being able to complete those additional items, and I've got an ebook that we're, we're launching here that sort of covers a bunch of that kind of stuff too. So people can get into beyond those things, you know, what you should do at the sponsor due diligence. But, you know, we're talking six months, nine months, 12 months just to say, hey, I think these guys are worthy. But then when a deal does come up, Right. There's that whole, you know, that, that, like we've said, the operator has been probably turning over deals, you know, till they're blue in the face and, you know, they can hardly, you know, see straight. Right. And so it, it, it you have sort of confirmation bias at some point <clears throat> where, you know, they, they, it, it's not to say they're doing it consciously, but at some point they want to, they want one of these deals to sort of pencil. So the value of then having a guy like John, you know, who knows what he's looking at, it hits his desk, which is what he's referring to, right? And he's he's basically, he's then taking the underwriting they've done and he's basically the one who's going to poke holes in it. And so why don't you give us sort of some, you know, like as a next step then, give us some insight into the things that you're doing when you sort of tear apart, you know, a deal, you know, at that level. Yeah, absolutely. And another thing just to talk about vetting the sponsors is I've gone so far to ask about articles of, you know, the, 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 the fun, not the fun, but the actual like, uh, EIN numbers and, and business oh, yeah. identification. Uh, so yeah, are, they go good stand, and yeah, are they in good standing? Well. Are they in good standing? Are they? Yeah. Most, most definitely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's so uh, as far as underwriting, some of the, some of the things I'd like to try to poke holes in is I, I actually, uh, I actually try to, I request the underwriting, on every uh, investment I, I do. So I look for, I actually go and 
do the underwriting kind of myself, not entirely, but I go and double check the market rate rents and seeing if those are, yep. you know, if I'm familiar with the markets, I'll check my spreadsheet and, and validate that. If I'm not familiar with it, I'll go and dive in. I'll go and check the tax. The tax is the biggest thing, making sure you can go in and with the county and seeing how spot on they are with that. Are they um, buffering for just a little bit more? Are they, for instance, Augusta, Augusta, once you're in Augusta, Georgia, once you're in for the taxes and you got a certain number um, and it's been contested or, 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 or if you've, uh, what's the word there? You've, um, uh, you've contested it, right? So you've said, all right, can we make sure we verify this and with the, because there's a, there's a thing that you can go ahead and say um, with the taxes in Augusta that if you, for instance, I'll use this. If it's 74,000 and you're saying, look, that's a, you know, that's we're assuming the loan or something like this. And, but it's really going to come back at, you know, you're contesting it for it to be 36 or even 56. I'll use 56 because it's more reasonable yeah. so because of whatever it is in Augusta. Once that number is hit, whether it's uh, 56 or 75, it's there for three years and you know it, it's there for three years now. So mm. you got to understand the, the different county tax uh, with the, even with the states too. So understanding that process too and going down and really digging deep into the weeds on that, uh, seeing how aggressive they are trying to push rents. Is it achievable? The business plan, is that really sustainable business plan? Yeah. How many units are you trying to ch- turn a month? How big is the asset that you're trying to turn those, many, those much units? Are you actually over raising to provide back for the prep. You can usually sometimes yeah. uncover that with the underwriting too. So that's a big discussion too d- lately. So yeah. having people understand that, you know, you're getting a return of capital or you're getting a return on capital when they're over raising. So just, just, just a lot of different things that I'm looking for. And one of them is mainly to see how aggressive. And another thing too, is I'm trying to see if the deal is going to pencil without uh, a refinance in the middle of it is the deal relying the IRR numbers relying on a refinance in year three yeah. so that's kind of what i'm trying to figure out and gauge when i'm underwriting or reviewing these underwriting practices from others yeah <clears throat> yeah exactly and that's it, you know it's like any skill right like it, it it's it's something that you can you know you you can get better at over time and you know but it's time consuming and 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 you know people know i mean I mean, I've seen it my whole life. Like they open, uh, you know, spreadsheets and it's just trying to figure out how the architect of that spreadsheet, where they are coming from. I mean, you're just, you know, it, it's, it can be overwhelming. And a lot of these pro formas and all these, you know, all these assumptions that are being made, you know, tearing into that stuff. It's just, it takes time. Not to mention like you, like you're saying is that it's not just a matter of like looking at their spreadsheet. Like you, you literally, you're, you're trying to figure out whether or not the business model, like you said, or the business plan is viable, which means you're going to have to go to other places. And like, you know, like you said, on the tax front, I mean, a lot of these, these transactions, I think of what you're hitting on as they get done and, you know, the, the taxing authority was, you know, the, the, the property taxes were based upon the old basis or the old whatever. And then the second they see that this, this transaction has been consummated, you know, at a different, you know, purchase price, you know, next, next thing, you know, oops, you know, the property taxes, you know, go up, you know, double when the operator was basically projecting them to stay at what, you know, the, the old property taxes or, you know, there's a bunch of gotchas in there. Right. And so I think the moral of the story, right. Is that the more eyes that are looking at it, the better. And there is, it's just confirmation bias is a real, is a real thing. And, you know, sometimes you see what you want to see. And I think that is the, the additional benefit of having more sophisticated outsiders, you know, sort of, digging into stuff and, and, and serving as sort of a sounding board and pushing back on these things, you know, during the process. And I think that's sort of what, you know, guys like John and firms like his sort of represent to the industry. And I think that's all, you know, it's all good stuff. At um, the end of the day, I'm acting like the fund is all my money. How would I want to protect the downside of all my money? Right. So if I'm investing, you know, the, the saying is you watch other people's money closer than you watch your money. So you, you hold, you're held to a higher responsibility, but at the same time, everybody's watching their money. They don't want to lose their money. So I act like it's my money and I'm protecting the downside as much as possible. Yeah, definitely. So I noticed too, it looks, it looks like you've, 
like some of the other things that you've been doing is sort of, you kind of have a consulting practice where you work with some other, other guys to on this kind of stuff. Is that sort of a part of what you've been up to as well? Yeah. I help other firms because a lot of people, the way they get into this is they, they start investing passively and they realize, Oh, you know, I want to be a syndicator too. And sure. then they start looking for partners and then they go and create their websites and it's awesome. It's great. I think it's, I think it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's pretty heroic because they're taking on entrepreneurism mm -hmm. on their own. Right. And so to, to, to combat that, what I see people do is they start raising capital for other people. So all your investors, you're kind of basically handing off your investors. Why not build a practice that is going to sustain you? Yeah. Uh, so they go and they hand off these investors, they get an acquisition fee, they come and pay the operation expenses, and then they're often doing it again. Now, if they're doing it safely and compliantly, good for them. They're part of the bit, they're part of the sponsorship and the part of the team. That's awesome. But if you can build your own fund and just figure out what are you good at? Are you good at finding other sponsors to invest in and keep, keep investing as a uh, LP? Do that for a living. Build your own fund. You're, if you find your own deal, you're eventually, you're basically going to fill out the or pay for the, yeah. the legal documents anyways. So do it your own. Fill out, your, build your fund, go and do what you've already been doing and monitor and report back to your investors. You keep your investors in house, you're building your practices, you're finding the right sponsors. And you're, if you're finding performing deals, good for you. Keep building the business. Yeah. That's how I build my consultant practice because I saw that there was a need for that. I saw that no one else was doing it. Everybody else was just looking for a mentor to go and find their own deals, a partner, or whatever you're going to do. Yeah. And, you know, I, I consult with people like you on my podcast when I, when I bring them on and just find out what their back end processes are like to give people an opportunity or other aspiring firms an opportunity to say, you know what, I like the way that sounds. I know I can handle that. I can probably do that. And now you got to figure out how you want to build your business going forward. Do you want to go ahead and be the guy that's active looking for partners and looking for money? Or do you want to be the guy that's doing exactly what you've already done, invested your capital. Just now you have a lot of friends and family that are asking you to do this. Mm -hmm. So might as well create your own fund and just go ahead and deploy it in these syndications that you're finding that you already have access to. Um, it, it also helps sponsors at the end of the day, you get to go ahead and negotiate maybe a higher uh, rate of return back to the fund. It also um, helps you because it, you know, you could either refer them or you can either create your own firm, which you probably already thought you thought about doing. So create your own firm and keep everything in house. That's yeah. how I see it. Yeah, no, I do. And I think that's why you and I hit it off here, right? It's like, it's the, uh, I mean, I think that for us on our side is, is, you know, especially with guys like John out there sort of helping with the, the, the higher level consultation of like, you know, making that transition from whatever, wherever you're at to, to doing it, especially if you've developed that, those skills we spoke of, of the ability to, you know, underwrite at the deal level. And you, know, you got to really, you know, that, that's, that's a valuable skill. And obviously you can use it for your own book and your own, you know, your own capital. But I think that that's that skill that has a lot of value because it takes time to sort of do that. And then, you know, for us, you know, making it easier to tilt up that investment vehicle, you know, which is, a, you know, often a kind of a close ended uh, uh, pooled investment fund, and then and then being able to administer that cost effectively, right? So because I think that's the whole key to it is obviously, you don't want a lot of bloat in fees, but make it to where the, the value being added is still accretive to the end user investor. And, you know, every it's kind of a win, win, win situation, um, where the, the operator, you know, can focus on executing the business plan, and not having to run after and, and chase after all these people, you know, to try to round up capital every time they do a deal, you know, they've got a, a group of people like John or whatever they can kind of reach out to and agree that, you know, the deal kind of fits the mandate for, you know, uh, you know, your group, John, or, or those that you're mentoring or whatever. And then to know that, you know, kind of all that back office compliance stuff is handled is sort of what, 
like I say, my day job is doing is, is, is running Verivest where we kind of do that. So um, I think it's good. It's, it's good to sort of see these are the shifts that are taking place in the industry. And, you know, I, I think that, and you're and the good news is you've been seeing a lot of this in the last five years, a lot more, and you were alluding to it, you know, like these, these, so there's been a lot of good things like the, the, the co GP thing where someone does partner up and the joint ventures. And so you've seen a lot of collaboration, you know, and, 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 and co you know, I guess we'll coopetition or whatever. So that's really good. Cause I'll tell you back in, in, you know, when I kind of got in the business or even as, you know, recent as 2012, 2013, it was the mentality was a lot different. It was sort of like every man for himself. And, and I think some of it wasn't, it was more of just everyone felt like they were on an Island wherever they did it. Right. And there was no path, but what we've seen with, you know, the jobs act really, you know, coming in and then the maturation that's taken place since then. And then just, you know, social media and all these things, like it's amazing to see how much, you know, networking and, and collaboration and things that are taking place. And so I think that that is sort of the, the indicator of what's to come here, which is sort of the model that, that John is, is putting forth. So I, I would say with, you know, all that said, you know, if you find yourself in that position, right, where you are a passive investor, but you feel like you're, um, you know, you feel like you really have a knack for digging in and tearing deals apart. I think that in particular is sort of the thing and also a knack for forming relationships with sponsors, right? And, and knowing and sort of have some conviction in what, you know, what you like and what you don't like. I think that those are the markers, um, you know, for, you know, you, you, you could become like, like John's done, you know, kind of a boutique, you know, private equity real estate shop. And with the help of, you know, a guy like John to sort of, you know, help you walk through that process. And I think a firm like, you know, I usually am not like stumping what we do at Verivest, but, you know, just, just to know that I think that there is a path there um, where there, there, there probably wasn't before, right? Like it, 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 it was, the barrier was too high before the costs, the legal costs to do the fund, the, 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 the administrative costs. I, I talked to a guy the other day, who's kind of in a similar situation to you, John, who, you know, tilted up a, you know, he's been watching us on the fairway side for years and sort of decided to strike out on his own as well and created his own little firm. And, but he's telling me, I was like, he's like, dude, I'm paying like four grand a month, you know, to, to do it, to administer the fund. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, that's, that's really expensive. Like that's, you know, it, it certainly would not cost that much for, for us to do it. Right. So, but that's once again, same with us is that it's all these years now of sort of improving the processes and kind of lowering the cost to, to deliver the services through technology and just, you know, process innovation and things. So um, last, last question I like to ask any really good stories of where, some, you know, where you've seen a deal or maybe it's a deal you did where you just, you saw someone just get their ass handed to them. Like it's just like an imploded deal. You got any, any juicy stories for the audience? Yeah, right now, man, my uh, my first JV opportunity, my my first investment. I mean, it's been two years where we haven't taken a dividend uh, because it was a total reposition. Yeah, and I say that confidently, and because it it taught me so much. Mm -hmm. Right, no one likes losing money. I want to protect my downside as much as possible, but now. I know what type of investments and what type of investments I like going forward. So just to give you a comparison, the 62 unit we took down, full renovation gut. Bef going in, we just knew that um, balconies need to be done and pipe, uh, unit turns were going to be done. We were at 70% occupancy when we took it down and we were going to keep that occupancy and just turn units as we go, right? Great, great idea. When we're doing the um, <laughs> when we're doing the, um, the 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 balconies, guess what? Units had to be exited, vacated. So we 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 emptied one building. People saw that the writing was on the wall or whatever. We didn't communicate good, yeah. and I thought we could. I thought we would. I wish we would have communicated better, saying, "Don't worry, we can put you in a better unit once we." up these units. But when that, when, when that one exited, everybody left. So we've been basically, you know, mass exited. 
funding the whole deal ourselves. We're now at 43% occupancy as we continue to come to fund this opportunity to get to the finish line. We see light at the end of the tunnel, but it's been a long two years. I say that because the next opportunity I did was it averaged 9% preferred returns. I mean, not, I mean, the preferred return was 7%, but it averaged 9% cash on cash return. So the difference is it taught me I like singles and doubles. That's how I look for investments now. I don't look for the home run. Not that I did on the first one. We thought we had a good business plan and it blew up on us because the building emptied and we didn't communicate well to investors. So knowing that is over communicate. I over communicate everything. If If you're sick of it, um, yeah, I don't do it intentionally, it right. yeah. but I just want to make sure you have enough information because it's just me. I rather know more than know nothing and then fail. So that's just basically the story I have. The 62 unit, we still have it. Yeah. Hasn't produced anything, but you know, we see light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, no, that's a good, it's a good point. And thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah. And I think too, you know, that's what I mean. Like those deep value ad plays, that is, I mean, at the end of the day, there's human beings that occupy the spaces and it, and it really is. And that's what I always say about the mobile home park sort of right now, it's just the darling and everyone just in, and just in love with mobile home parks, but more than any strategy, it, it's, if you don't have a really strong communicator on, I mean, unless you're going in and buying some stable hundred percent park owned park, you know, in Florida where no one's ever going to move or they die and someone else takes their place or whatever, like, it's just, it's if you're going to go in and be doing a value add sort of, you know, raise rents, whatever mobile home park, same thing, man. Like it's just, it's looks simple on the surface, but it's, it's, these are people's lives. And like you said, that's the hard part about those deeper value add deals is just that it's like, it's so, it can be so disruptive and it's hard to execute the strategy and work around people, you know, and then once again, once they, you know, they're a community, whether you realize like, like these people share walls, with one another. And if you lose them and whatever, and something happens, it can't be, un, you know, but no one talks about it. Like it just doesn't get talked about enough that what's the communication strategy, yeah. you know? And it's in like, like you learned, like, it's just, you, you know, like we all do, we tend to learn the hard way, right? It's just things that, that just didn't, you know, we didn't, didn't think it through, or we, it's not that we didn't, it's just that you didn't give enough weight to it or something, you know? And then, like you said, like you look back hindsight being 2020, like, man, I wish it was a stronger communications plan, right. To assure them, you know, and it's just, it happens. I mean, I've been running businesses since I'm 20 years old and man, you know, the hard, the part I've always struggled with the most is just, it's the people it's the, I mean, it's just, it's, it's hard. It's hard to communicate everyone. You know, they take in information differently, you know, all those things. And like, you know, and that was my first lesson was that my mentor told me, I'm like, but I've already told them this. Why do I have to keep repeating myself? He's like, Lance, you're going to repeat yourself till you're blue in the face. Like, it's just, you have to, that's your job. Right. And I think that's what you're saying. Like, it's just over communicate, just keep saying it again and again and again to make sure there is no confusion. So, yeah, I think that's a, that's a good a good sort of, you know, insight into once again, passive investor looking at these things. If it's some crazy return that's being projected and we're going to do this and we're going to add a bunch, you know, a bunch of money per door and do all these things, then, then it's, it's not just in the numbers. It's like, who's the one that's going to make sure that all the tenants, you know, are aware of what's going on and you're going to make sure that they, you know, don't have mass exodus and, you know, an uphill climb and things like that. Absolutely. Know exactly what to look for going forward. But I tell you what, though, I learned so much off this that if I was to find another opportunity similar to this, I know exactly what to do the next time. Not that I'm looking for those. I'm looking for more, like I said, singles and doubles, cash flowing from day one. I'm not buying for appreciation uh, and, you know, just looking for the five factors of the way real estate pays us, you know, so that's that's it. Cool. Well, why don't you let us know before we, we finish here is uh, where can people find you? Uh, thank you for having me, by the way. Like I said, please go rate and review Lance's podcast. He's awesome, man. Phenomenal guy. Reach out to him too. So to, to if you want to learn more about me and what I do and the type of funds I'm operating is you can reach out at johnfortes.com, F-O-R-T-E-S. And uh, I'm pretty much on all social media. Um, I have a podcast called The Passive Investor Show. If you want to know how to start your own firm or just reach out to Lance, man. Verifest. There you go. Cool. Thanks, John. It's been great. Take care, man. 
I appreciate you. Thank you. God bless.